Good morning. Uh, thank you all for being here. This is, I'm just going to start this morning's grand rounds with a neuro-ophthalmology case presentation, and then Derek will do our main course. Our patient was a 64-year-old right-handed en engineer. He came to the neuro-ophthalmology clinic because he was complaining of episodic flickering of vision. His story began with sinus disease. He said he'd had this sinus disease for about 40 years and it had been slowly getting worse. For the last year and a half, he had been experiencing this popping noise in his right ear. And with the popping noise, he had uh, post-nasal drip and a cough. And he also had his associated visual symptoms at that time. He was a very observant person. If he, cl he stated that if he closed his left eye, he had the movement of everything in his vision with that right eye. But if he closed his right eye and was just looking at the world with his left eye, everything was normal. We had another patient in clinic who described what they saw as the old black and white movies, the way it would flicker on the screen. He just he was very descriptive. It was vertical and rotational, and every object in the visual field of his right eye moved this way. He said that it would occur numerous times throughout the day, and it lasted for approximately 15 to 20 minutes. He also noted that he could sometimes trigger it by looking to the right and then back to center. Interestingly, he had surgery done in June of 2010 for his sinus disease, and that improved his sinus symptoms, and he was also free of his visual symptoms for approximately three weeks. And then as his sinus symptoms returned, his visual symptoms started to recur. His ocular history, he did have myopia and presbyopia. He wore glasses for this, and he had a history of chemical burn in both eyes from wood preservative. His medications, he wasn't on anything that would cause nystagmus, and the remainder of his history was really non-contributory. On exam, his vision was good. His color and stereo vision, as well as visual fields to confrontation were normal. He didn't have any proptosis. His pupillary exam was normal, and extraocular movements were normal. He did have a minuscule left hyper that was worse in right gaze with Maddox rod testing, but only with the Maddox rod could you pick that up. On anterior segment exam, he did have a in linear inferotemporal scar in his left eye, but otherwise normal. And his dilated fundoscopic exam, as well as his neuro exam, was normal. So his diagnosis was right superior oblique myokymia based on his clinical history. It was helpful in this instance because he had been to an outside ophthalmologist who had observed the eye movements at the time that they were occurring and had diagnosed him with superior oblique myokymia, but had referred him to neuro-op clinics for a second opinion as well as for management. Now there have been no, on, on literature review, there have been no case reports that show that sinusitis can cause superior oblique myokymia. But in his case, it did seem to be very associated with his symptoms. And, you know, Dr. Warner and I were talking about it, and she was wondering if maybe it was some irritation of the superior oblique muscle through the ethmoid air cells. However, on MRI, he only, it only showed mild sinus disease, and the lamina propria was um, normal. He, his trochlear nerves were also normal. So for him, his treatment, since his symptoms were so associated with sinus disease, was to control the sinuses. If his symptoms ever become dissociated or he has worsening of his visual symptoms, he can return to the neuro-ophthalmology clinic. And at that point, we probably offer him Neurontin or Tegretol. Superior oblique myokymia was first uh, described by Alexander Duane in 1906. He described it as a unilateral rotary nystagmus after he had seen a 24-year-old healthy girl that had this nystagmus and no other problems could be found. Hoyt and Keene later had five patients with episodic monocular incursion. The nystagmus was high, at high frequency and low amplitude, um, and patients also described the same sensation of jiggling and oscillopsia. And they introduced the, ter the term superior, superior oblique myokymia. So what exactly is it? It's a rare recurring motility disorder. It's typically unilateral. As mentioned before, the nystagmus is high frequency and low ab amplitude, and patients will describe an intermittent vertical or torsional oscillopsia. And it's due to contraction of the superior oblique muscle, but what causes that contraction of the superior oblique muscle isn't really known. 
It's typically lasts for seconds, but it can last longer. And the severity ranges from mildly annoying to incapacitating, uh, and it depends on how frequently it occurs and how long it lasts. Often patients note that it's more noticeable to them when they do tasks that require near vision. And if you get tonic contraction of the superior oblique, they can get double vision. So this is just a video to show you what the eye movements look like. You can see the movement best over here. So as I mentioned before, the etiology is unknown. Uh, microvascular compression has been proposed as well as intracranial lesions or trauma that results in aberrant regeneration of the fourth cranial nerve. There are a few case reports showing association with multiple sclerosis or posterior fossa tumors, but it's only an association. The prognosis is good. It's a variable to benign course. Patients often have spontaneous remissions and relapses, but the good news is they don't typically have any associated neurological or muscular disorders. Most patients should be imaged with MRI to make sure that there's not a secondary etiology causing this. In one uh, study using six patients, they looked at high-res MRI, and looking at that, they found that there were neurovascular contacts with the root exit zone uh, in 100% of the affected eye and there was 0% of this contact in the normal eye. Uh, medications are typically used if the symptoms are bothersome to the patient. Uh, typical medications are Tegretol or Neurontin. In one retrospective study looking at approximately 20 patients, 16 of the 20, they were all on a different combination of these medications, but they had improvement in their, of their symptoms, and this was over a long-term follow-up of approximately six years. Surgery can also be done if it's severely disabling to the patient. Um, techniques used include the superior oblique tenotomy or tenectomy with weakening of the ipsilateral inferior oblique, or you can do myo myectomy of the superior oblique with recession of the trochlea. The problem with, with surgery is that there is 50% uh, recurrence, and depending on uh, how much you do to the superior oblique, you can get superior oblique palsy. And these are my references. Any questions?